Hey everyone, it's Classic DM. It's the 50th anniversary of the original release of Dungeons and Dragons. And we did a video the other day that talked about like what's Wizards of the Coast doing. And we, we posed a question. We said, hey, what should we do? Well, you know, some of you guys and girls who probably, I mean, this is 1974, dude. I'm 58 years old and I didn't get into D&D till the basic edition came out. Which was around, well, I don't know, what, 77, 76? And then Advanced Dungeons and Dragons was the one we really dived into because we were in middle school and we could figure it out. But most people, right, there are some folks older than me, people who got into the original D&D, right, and didn't get grabbed by a D&D. Well, what's the deal with it? Like, it's a three books and a box set. It has the same kind of vibe as Classic Traveler. It's always, some people are, like, very adamant about saying that it's the best version ever, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just tell you and by showing you <laughs> let's show you how do you get a copy of that right without going to e ebay and paying twelve hundred dollars how do you get a copy of it in a functional form and what's actually in it and what are some of the weirdness that's in there from the original because this is the very first time the the game had evolved into some kind of published form and, and caught on right and there's a lot of if you've got a copy of the art and arcana visual history book um it's worth getting it's a huge thick coffee table book i don't have a picture of it here um, but it's got all the old pictures and explains the history. And even though Hasbro is saying they're making, you know, one of the authors of that is John Peterson. It, even though John Peterson is putting out a book later this year in July or something, you don't really need it. You can go back and get the Art and Arcana book. It has all the wonderful pictures of all the original stuff. Okay, so what I'm going to do in the video, how do you get a copy of it? Well, we're here on Drive-Thru RPG. I'll show you the simplest way to find this thing. Once you get logged into the drive through RPG, just go to Publishers right away. This is the best way to filter any of the D&D stuff. And of course, you know, every publisher pretty much is there. Wizards is at the bottom. And when you go to Wizards with the new, you know, revitalized website they did last year and early this year, you get to this kind of splash page, which has all in the center here is all the major games. So if, you, if, you, if you've been around for a long time, you recognize the difference between this logo and this logo and this logo, and this logo, and this logo, and this logo. There's lots of versions of Dungeons and Dragons in here. There's Advanced, there's Original, there's Second Edition, there's Third Edition, Fourth Edition, etc. You want this really old Wild West goofy saloon version, even when you hover over it, it says D&D, the Original Edition. And all you really, really need to do is get this one here that's flagged as, as the, I have it already, the OD&D Dungeon Dragons. This is the three books and a reference book, and we're gonna look at the PDF versions today. Now, it mentions chainmail, and there's movement rules for the miniature rules and chainmail, which are a little wonky. And D and D, original D and D, and advanced D and D always suffer from these really unrealistic movement rate systems, but they were consistent across the whole game. So let's we're gonna dig in next into um, let's go take a look next at the actual uh, PDFs. So let's put that web browser down, and let's bring this other stuff up. All right. If you go to drive through RPG and pay 10 bucks and get this, what are you going to get? Well, you're going to get these three um, really, really old <laughs> from 1974. This is back before computers, right? This is not ditto machine. This is actual printing. These are original books. Let's look inside this and let you see, like, do I really want this? Or is this something I would ever play? Um, or do I just like to have it because I want to read how, where it came from? It's like, do you like world history? You know, it's the same kind of thing. So... In the beginning, there's some things that are right off the bat that are really different that evolved in AD&D, which is the classes. And you know, this was evolving from miniatures. So fighting men, okay, not fighters, not warriors, you know, not anything like that, or you know, soldier characters or warrior characters like in my own game. Fighting men, which basically just meant anyone who could swing a sword, wear armor, use a shield, use a bow, whatever you wanted to do, right? And then there's magic users. That name persisted, of course. And then there's clerics. So if you think about it, even in uh, Decimation Kingdoms and Empires, which I'm in the process of adding fantasy elements to it for, to celebrate D&D &D this year, you know, you think of men on the battlefield wearing chainmail using spears or longbows and maybe there's some clerics who are holy men in the catholicism area or protestant era or even in uh, muslim so but magic users wasn't really there you always hear about sorcerers in egypt and things like that in the bible and this kind of business but there's basically just these three classes the fighting men magic users and clerics and then they kind of the layout of the book and the way it's written is really kind of jumbled it's a little jumbled mess um, it's not as easy to go back and edit things back then as it is today with a computer. So they had humans, and then they had, you know, elves, dwarves, and halflings, and there was limitations on them. Like, for example, if you're going to play a dwarf, you couldn't be beyond level 6 
in the fighting class, but you had advantage, had high la magic resistance, and you had higher level saving throws and things like that, that kind of stuff. So that was something that made it a uh, um, different. Like all these fantastical races of, of elves, dwarves, and halflings, they're included, but they're not as free as they are in the later versions, right? You're used to being like, hey, I'm playing a level eight cleric. Some of those rules carried over to AD&D. &D. They didn't really carry over here, right? So I'm going to turn the music down a little bit sure it's not too loud. All right. So they had alignment. Okay, great. This is the very first time you ever see alignment. Uh, you know, it talks about how men are this, and this is neutrality, and this is chaos. So it's just law, neutrality, and chaos, which is very much like the Elric of Elibon, uh type of thinking. When you get past this part, and you start doing the ability scores, this is where the original strength, intelligence, wisdom, constitution, dexterity, charisma comes from. You're just rolling three six-sided dice. There's no drawing four and taking the highest three. Just very straightforward. And everything's called a prime requisite. It's not called an ability score. So you see the word prime requisite. And that's where some uh, different bonuses and penalties will come, whether you have them. Like, for example, if your prime requisite is 15 or higher, you get 10% ex earned experience bonus. This carried over into AD&D. &D. If you look at every single one of the class entries, from the fighter to the ranger to the cleric to druid, all those things, you'll see that they all have this 10% earned experience if your main ability score is over a certain level. Um, they have some other uh, pluses and minuses, like you lose experience if you're really, if your prime requisite's like eight or a seven. So there's some real, first time you're really seeing individual characters with the ability scores and a couple of things. There's no bin bars, lift gates, and no uh, you know system shock survival, but there's a couple of things in here related to hirelings. And this is probably coming from the fact that you know, the game evolved from a war game. In a war game, you have you know, whole armies on the field. So we have this heroic characters, and they have ability scores, but they might have some henchmen or hirelings. So the whole henchmen and hireling additional foddery soldiers thing is still pretty much present in the first version of uh, original D&D. Um, they talk about non-player characters and non-player characters of monsters that you might capture, relatives in the family. This stuff even persisted into the Dungeon Master's Guide in AD&D. &D. When we played, we never, ever, ever had hirelings because we always thought it was more exciting that all of us were playing one or two characters, right? And there'd be four or five of us at the table. So it'd be 10 characters in a, in a massive party doing Tomb of Horrors or Hidden Tron, Tomb of Shan, even the Vault of the Drow. And when someone would drop out, someone else would cover the characters, et cetera. We didn't really have a, a bunch of additional hirelings that were scrubs that couldn't hit anything. They had low AC or carrying gold. We didn't get in that much detail, probably because we're 12, 13, 14 years old. So we're really young. Um, but they do have that, and then it goes into the basic equipment and costs and gold pieces. And this is where the first time you really see the whole, like, well, how much does a gold piece weigh? And the weight of a man is considered, you know, 1,750 gold pieces. But if, you're, if, if you're, your load in gold, piece, gold pieces equals to light foot movement is 12 inches. And this is something we really want to dig into here. The different movement rates in original D&D &D and in AD&D &D are weird. Uh, they use these hash marks, which means inches in architecture. You know, does it literally mean inches on a battlefield? Well, if you go to Chainmail, right, the original, uh, you know, the original version of the rules, and I think it's on page 9 or 10, they say at the very bottom here, you know, for figures, assume that one inch equals 10 yards, which is 30 feet, right? And one turn of play is roughly equivalent to one minute in time in battle. We're, t we're looking down here at the very bottom here, right? And that's for 30 millimeter figures. Well, that's basically 28 millimeter. So when Ralph Hoffa and somebody in Grenadier start making these figures and, and wargaming figures were that size too, they originally they're thinking, oh, okay, this is how much movement rate there's going to be in the chain mail rules. But when you go back to here, they talk about the movement rate using an inch hash mark, but they don't say how much it is, like how far is it? And we all know who who played D&D, &D, first and AD&D and &D second edition, that the one inch tech mark meant 10 feet, right? You'll see a lot of the old maps and stuff don't use the five inch, one inch equals five by five feet, right? So that's something that you have to like, uh, I got to figure this out. Do we, we, you, one minute long melee round, right? Uh, and you're having this really long movement rate is 120 feet technically for someone in one minute to move in combat while actively defending themselves, et cetera. So that's all in there, but you don't really see any major details about the classes. They're just mentioned in a paragraph. So these very streamlined rules. There's also a very interesting section in the Art and Arcana book that talks about all the, like, there's kind of some real amateurish art done from a long time ago, because this is low-budget publication. This isn't like some high-dollar publication. A lot of these were almost traced from some comic books uh, or inspired by. So it's always been very suspicious how some of the pictures, like this barbarian picture, is like almost a one-to-one 
uh, copy of a book from a comic book. If you ever want to look that up on the internet, you know, it doesn't really matter in the modern world whether that's true or not, but this barbarian picture is uh, done by a guy named Bell. It's a close match to Nick Fury's segments called Armageddon from the same issue of Strange Tales. That happened a lot, and I can see why that would happen. Um, it, it's kind of odd, but hey, this was a long time ago, and who knows anymore. This is Greg Bell. Um, his illustrations are through his book. Oh, so besides that, you have the amount of experience you need, and all the levels have a title to them. Like, you know, if you're a high-level cleric, you become a curate, then a, a bishop, a lama, a patriarch, and you're a warrior, you a fighting, fighting man, you become a swashbuckler, hero, mermaiden, et cetera. So there isn't a mention of, like, level eight warrior. You're just called a champion now. So it isn't that big of a deal. There was limitations on levels. You could be as an elf and a dwarf. Yes. Okay. So you probably get a sense so far, if you played the original D&D, like the basic edition, the blue cover, or you played AD&D, that some of the stuff is pretty much the same. Well, some things are very different because the dice for accumulated hits, you know, hit points that we have today, everything is based on a D6. Everything is D6. There's no, even though they have polyhedral dice, we're only using a D20 to roll a hit and do saving throws, and all the damage is D6, and all the hit dice are D6. And the way you can kind of validate this on page 19 at the bottom, which says, all attacks which score hits do 1 to 6 damage unless otherwise noted. So you can see that the number of hit dice or hit points that a warrior would get would be 1 plus 1 or 2 or 3. Those are the number of dice you would get, right? So you, if you were a swordsman in the original D&D, you had 3 D6 hit points, right? If you're a magic user and you're like a magician, you would have 3d6 plus one. One, two, three, four, five. That's like a level five or six magician as opposed to like a level three warrior. So the scaling is happening here. There's no thieves. There's no assassins. It's just, you know, fighting men, magic users, and clerics. The spell levels are in there as well. And that system's not really explained much either. But the one thing that's very funny, and we hated this rule as a kid. We, uh, and we still today, I don't use it. And no one really uses it anymore. Um, you would fight a monster and defeat the monster and get a boatload of treasure, right? And you would get experience based on the treasure. Like for uh, the calculation on page 18 says, hey, let's assume you gain 7,000 gold pieces by defeating a troll, which is a seventh level monster, as it has over six hit dice. Had the monster only been a fifth level one, you'd be awarded five eighths, the basis already stated, et cetera. So you award the experience based on 7,000 gold pieces plus 700 is 7,700 experience. So this was in AD&D and in the Dungeon Master's Guide, but we never used it. We always thought it was kind of odd to... Uh, go in a dungeon, have a fight to the death against someone, and then finding that in their purse, there was 7,000 gold pieces, this was probably 700 pounds or something, or there was a chest in the same room and it had some rubies worth a bunch of money. And it's like, why am I getting 23,000 experience points for a bunch of cash when I fought something that I killed in two melee rounds only had 14 hit points? It wasn't really realistic. That, if you remove the experience point uh, system for gold, you would need to award people like milestones, like, hey, at the end of the session, I'm going to award everyone additional 5,000 experience points for your resourcefulness, your ability to, to uncover all the secret doors and do all these kinds of stuff. And that's not ever explained. Like, that's never a rule. But in the modern day, if you go back and play this, you may want to consider doing that kind of stuff. Otherwise, you may find that in two rooms <laughs> with a lot of loot on it and <laughs> If you were able to large party with a bunch of hirelings, you bring down a troll and five hirelings die and this other person dies and three people are still alive, then you're suddenly a swashbuckler, right? Uh, because you've gained, you just skipped through so many levels. So the progression system in the original OD&D o D or original D&D &D is a little goofy and some of the things that carried over from uh, into AD&D. &D. Now, combat, right? So you're rolling to hit. The, the, the Rolling the D20 to hit was based on armor class. This is the only place that armor class is ever described. There was no armor class 10 like you see in AD&D. &D. It was the same kind of ascending. The lower the number, the harder you are to hit, like plate and shields, armor class 2. Um, then they had different brackets. Like for the fighting men, they had a better chance to hit versus the magic users versus the cleric. So that's over here on page 19. That's pretty much the same kind of thing you would see in like your DM screen in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. And then enemies would use a different system to try to, the monster attacking table, and that carried over almost di directly into AD&D. And so did the saving throw metric. So if you're a magic user uh, from level six to 10, your death ray 
poison, you know, saving throw was 11. Now, in this version of D&D, you had to roll higher than. So that means 11, the target number, I got to roll a 12 or 13 or 14, just like in modern D&D, right? Then all the spells were listed. The spells are real basic. There's no VSM or, you know, somatic components or any of that kind of stuff. It's just really two sentences, you know, explaining exactly what to do. Healing is something that's very interesting to take about, uh, go back and take a look at. Is uh, you have some really amateurs pictures in here. The uh, cleric spells. Let's go to that. The very first one's cure light wounds, which is two to seven, which is a one d a six out of die plus one. And then later on, there's a cure serious wounds, um, which you add, they call it adding a pip. Means you add another number to it. So you roll two six out of dice and add a pip to each one to get four to fourteen. There's no heal, like heal's not in this version of the, of the game, and there's no cure critical wounds. So as the very first pass, the first book, you walk away with, okay, I've got fighting men, magic users, clerics. I've got humans, elves, dwarves, and halflings, but there's limitations or levels. Everyone's using a D6 hit point system, and I'm uh, using a D20 and roll to hit, and you can have combat, and that's pretty much it. The second book you get, if you buy that $9, $10 pack, is a monster and treasure guide. This is very, very reminiscent of just what you saw in the Dungeon Master's Guide in AD&D, where it lists all the monsters, says how many might be appearing, and in the armor class, their movement in inches, which isn't really explained very well. It's always been a weakness. Their hit dice, the chance you find them in their lair, um, the noun of treasure they would have in a treasure table. And you, then you just have these basically write-ups of what a kobold is and a knoll and an ogre and, you know, dragons are in here and giants and they talk about, you know, frost resistance on giants. And like, for example, hill giants are hit dice eight. Their lair is a cave. They're, they're about 12 feet tall. Unusual characteristics, none. <laughs> so it's very straightforward because this stuff is basing all these enemies like gorgons and manacords, wraiths, mummies, ghoul skeletons, cockatrices, vampires. This is all just some standard fantasy like there's nothing there's no githyanki in here that's not until fiend folio right so the second book is just kind of like a dm's book uh monsters and treasures pretty much used by the dungeon master there's nothing really in here for the player right how to figure out how to make money how to uh, distribute the experience all that kind of stuff is in here so then you go to the last book right the last book is the underworld and wilderness adventures well this is where you're talking about how to run a dungeon what's it like the movement rates for the different types of spaces you know some some rough sketches of like here's a dungeon the first and second third level the higher the number the lower it is a sample le a level a sample description of a level it's the tricks and traps that might be in there the monsters and treasures so this is like never ever been described like if you never ever knew it's called Dungeons and Dragons. What's the dungeon part? Like in world history, a dungeon is where someone's being tortured, right? It's not a place where you go exploring the labyrinth of rooms and hallways, perfectly shaped passages to find monsters hanging out and doing nothing in the darkness, right? So this one, moment, one section here is worth mentioning. Movement. Movement distances given in book one is in segments of approximately 10 minutes. This takes 10 minutes to move about two moves, 120 feet for a fully armored character. Two moves constitute a turn, except in flight pursuit situations. So you can see even there, the movement and the time relationship is just way wacky, way wacky. So if you do go back and try to play the super simplified version of D&D &D with kids or something like that, or your grandkids, um, you know, you're going to have to kind of fix the movement thing. I always felt that if you're going to do it and keep it simple... Use the six-second melee round. Use 25 feet for net average for normal person's movement. So every time you see 12 inches, that means 25 feet. It doesn't mean inches. 25 feet is five inches on a one-inch grid with a five-by-five five square. That makes it so much easier. I, I'm not going to mention any other house rules. That's up to you guys. Everyone knows some of my house rules are wacky. I'm more on the goofy kid side than anything else. And then it talks about, you know, the monster levels. So if you're making a little dungeon and you want to put something level four, you can put an evil priest in there. Or if you're at level three, you can put giant ants or ochre jelly, etc. So this gives you the information you need to kind of make your first dungeon. How to, And they have an example, a gameplay session. I mean, even in the latest version of Pathfinder Remaster, everyone's always done this. You know, someone did it first. And everyone has copied it ever since. It's the evolution. The referee is not called the dungeon master. The referee and the player is playing through it. And they tell what they're going to do. You tell them what they see. So this is the very first time that this has ever been done. It's, 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 you have to give it credit, even though it's, it's not brought to the level that we are used to today. It's the first stake in the ground for D and D and it's pretty crazy and it's actually pretty original. I mean, it is the one of the most original games ever created that and traveler. I think D and D and traveler both deserve equal accolades. Although traveler was never as popular 
Um, so, and then it has things about building castles and what kind of people you need to have in your castles. There's a huge overemphasis of this, in my opinion. But hey, you know, maybe that's what the dream was to become a, a have earn thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of gold and have a big keep and then make a little map and have your keep. And then what are you going to do, right? Just pay taxes or something, collect taxes, go out and fight monsters. So they have angry villager rules and all these kind of details. This element, I don't, in the long run, as you can see, this doesn't really carry over. In the modern world, everyone's excited about going on big adventures and big campaigns across Faroon and all this stuff in Greyhawk. And it's about being the heroic character with your friends. It's not about sweeping the floors and making sure there's no crocodiles in the canals, you know? So, but this was all here for the original movement, uh, excuse me, the original version of the game. So when you get through all this rules, you finally get these reference sheets, which just basically bring back together all the little elements and pieces that were along the way. So when you're playing the game, you can pull it up pretty quickly. It has all the different uh, wandering monsters and magic items and things like that. It doesn't really have the, it has a saving throw matrix in there and the cost of equipment it has a hit matrix too. So in theory, if you just have this one page here, right? Because you don't have to, you don't have to memorize that a long sword does 1d8 damage for a medium sized target and one to 12 versus a giant. You just need this one page. And you just need to make sure you know what the hit dice and armor class numbers of monsters. That's all you need to know. It's just hit dice, armor class, hit points, right? Weapon used for attack because a lot of monsters are using their hands and stuff and claws to attack and biting. And then what your chances are to hit and you play the game. That's all you really need to do is really straightforward, very simple. So I wanted to do this kind of rapidly. It's very easy for you to... If you already own this, you, you know more about it than me because we never played this version. We never played Chainmail and we never played the original D&D. We started on the basic edition with the blue box set, which is pretty good. But it's, it's this a little more refined, which came with one of the very, very early adventures in Search of the Unknown. So in summary, that's basically what I wanted to do. I wanted to give you a chance to see what's inside those three little books. You know, this is the anniversary 50 years since this original book was created and uh, it really changed everything. Like I've been doing video games now. I was an architecture for 10 years and I've been doing video games now since Unreal, like 1995, making maps on, I was a modder for Doom on CompuServe, Doom 2. And I have to tell you, man, on the, some of the maps I made in Unreal and Unreal Tournament, I mean, this inspired by our D&D campaigns. You know, I mean, how many times have you heard guys that worked on the Virgil EverQuest you know, talk about being inspired from playing D&D or don't you think Paizo is inspired by playing D&D? Everyone's been inspired by this stuff. It was, it's an amazing game form that's not a board game. It, it allows people to have so much fun with it. So there you have it. That's the original, you know, version of D&D. It's uh, rough around the edges, but it's quite simple. And uh, you could do a lot with just this basic, basic system. And um, you could modify it to however you see fit. And it's, it's great. It's fantastic. I'm just so glad it happened. <laughs> uh, and who knows? It's very funny because in summary, what I'll say is like, there's never been anything since, you know, there's no one has ever made a tabletop role-playing game that has truly established IPs. Now board games is different. I mean, board games is different. Like we'll look at Warhammer. I mean, that Warhammer is huge. Just a different animal completely. But it wasn't based on a role-playing game. This game was pretty much a, a transference of wargaming into uh, role-playing games. But yeah, there you have it. So I hope you enjoyed looking at this video. I didn't want to go through too much dirty, gritty detail because there's really not that much gritty detail there to, to deal with in the first place. Um, I do have a lot of things planned for this year. I've been thinking about what we can do to celebrate D&D. And uh, I'll do a video on that separately so you don't have to listen to it anymore, okay? Well, have fun, and thanks for popping in. And leave a comment, you know, engage with this stuff. I, I always reply and engage with anyone that has something to say on the YouTube channel because we're still really small. I feel the YouTube channel isn't about making money and screaming to the microphone. It's about sharing the cool stuff that some guys from my generation and other people from younger generations, they just love it, man. When you love something, yeah, you want to hear more about it. So, all right, have fun. And let's hope Volkanovsky wipes the floor with Tapuria this weekend. All right, take care. We'll talk to you later.